as we've watched this huge spike in gender-based violence, um, I think it's truly, truly called attention to how much gender matters. And particularly in a moment when so much science is being ignored by some of our leaders, I think bringing this data lens, and particularly the paper that you all worked on, I wanna commend you for that. Um, so what's up with men and what's up with masculinities in this moment? First off, I wanna say in talking about that and in looking at men's death rates, we need to put this in a lens of, mas of of intersectionalities. It's not just male versus female. It's not a zero sum game. We also wanna look at as relational, what men's higher death rates mean for women in particular around caregiving and other issues. So a few key points. One is that we don't know much. The Currently, the gender discussion of men's higher death rates is kind of simply disaggregating data and death rates by sex. That's a very crude measure, as we both, as we all know, in terms of gender. But let me go to a few things that we do know, and some of it come from what we know about other um, health issues affecting men and women in different ways. So the point, point one that's already been made is that men are dying at higher rates. Everywhere we have data so far, it's about twice um, about twice of the deaths have been men. It's, if I have the numbers correct, at least the, the most recent ones you can find, 70% of deaths in Italy, 64% in China, about 60% in the U.S. New York being the epicenter in the U.S. is 59% of deaths. Or the, sorry, those hospitalized with COVID have been men. 55% who have tested positive are men, and 62% of the deaths have been men. Um, with that, again, that's a, that's a crude but important measure to have there. That takes us to the point of why more men? What is happening there? Um, globally, we know this mirrors lots of other health issues. Men die on average, as we know globally, five years earlier than women. We don't know how much of that is social, is social determinants, and how much of that is biological. What we do know and need to affirm is that it's always both, and it's typically interacting. Um, we've done a review recently of the global burden of disease data pre-COVID that found that 40 per, that basically 40% of men's early death can be explained by three factors. One of those is smoking and well actually nutrition in first place, smoking in second place, alcohol in third place. We certainly have seen some of the data that smoking has been implicated and we think nutrition is as well as some of the social factors related to men. Um, China, we know men's smoking rates are about twice that of women. Certainly, given the, the effects of the disease on, on the respiratory system, that's one of the factors we think is involved. Italy, we don't see quite that big a gap, but almost 30% of men smoke in Italy compared to 19% of women. U.S., the difference is about 18% of men, 14% of women. That's clearly there. We also have to look at men's limited health-seeking behavior. Men, as we know from the HIV pandemic, are less likely to go for testing and preventive services. They're less likely to go for follow-up to know if they're positive or if they have a given disease. There's some data as well showing that men are less likely to follow some of the recommendations around hygiene and hand washing. Um, we also see at some households that women are the ones reminding men to be doing hygiene and hand washing, among other things. So it's still too early to know all these factors, but it is important to say we know it's probably both. There are both biological and social determinant issues. Point three, and I think this one seems to be really missing, or missing at least as much as it could be talked about, is which men as well as which women. It's really tough to find data that breaks down beyond um, simply men versus women. We've got some data in the U.S. suggesting and affirming in some settings, Chicago, Michigan, Washington, D.C., that the impact is disproportionate on men of color, particularly African-American, but we've seen some of the data out of New York on Latino men. So clearly there's other things going on, and I think the descriptions that we've heard of the reasons we've heard, at least in the public health field in the U.S. the last couple of days, have been really inadequate of talking about the structural disadvantages that populations of color and men of color and women of color face, whether it's historical housing discrimination, unemployment and underemployment, historical poverty, access to health services. Um, my partner works on the front line of the response to the Latino population here in D.C., we see how much the immigrant population is fearful even of using any, any health services. So that complex of issues, and I've seen little discussion that looks at both gender and looks at these other intersectional issues. The fourth point I think is important to make is that it's intersectional, sorry, that it's relational. Um, this is not about saying, oh, we need to pay more attention to men or more attention to women. What happens with high rates of men's mortality, whether from COVID or other external causes, 
women often pick up the pieces. These are households affected when men die earlier um, and when men don't get the attention they need. Men's lack of, the lack of services for men and men's lack of use of services is an additional burden on the already unequal care burden that women are facing both before COVID and during COVID. So where do we go with this? Um, a few key recommendations. One, we need data. We've got to convince the public health field and those who, although this might not be the exact moment to do it, but to say um, it's not a gender lens simply by offering sex dis disaggregated data. We need much deeper in terms of getting at the intersectionalities of it, because that's really where we come up with the best responses for specific groups of women at higher risk and why. And particularly as we move to the response phase, we need the similar kind of granular approach that asks about sex disaggregation, but also looks at these other social factors. Um, I think we need to also put this in the framework of universal health care. If you look at a few countries that are doing better on this, um, Portugal, one of those, as you look at the numbers, it is mostly about universal access and starting early. No one being turned away from services, no questions asked about who gets the services. Those kinds of universal health system approaches seem to work much better. Whatever gender lens we apply needs to be within that. The third point is that we need to think about promoting a culture of self-care and care for men, whether it's doing an equal amount of care at home um, and also how we care for our bodies as men. That's been an issue discussed by Global Action on Men's Health and WHO on how do we promote changes in masculinity so that men do more of this. And just as a final point, we did a survey with parents in the U.S. just as COVID was beginning to hit, asking them about their expectations of their sons and disturbing to see how many continue to push their sons into a or believe their sons are stuck in a box that doesn't let them show vulnerability. We'll be, yeah, give you some data points for that. 66% of parents say their sons don't feel comfortable showing when they're scared. 72% say their sons don't feel comfortable showing when they're sad. 41% say their sons feel pressure to hide their feelings if they feel either of these things. And 45% of their sons feel pressure not to cry. As you think about what this pandemic means, the pressure, the loss, the loss of livelihoods, we need men being able to connect up with our need to be empathetic, to be connected, to be vulnerable and to support those who are vulnerable. So I think we've got to look at there's both an opportunity and a crisis. Households locked with women unable to leave violent relationships is creating a tremendous vulnerability and huge, um, huge disadvantages for women at the moment. The opportunity is that we've probably never had as many parents as home with their children and including particularly fathers at home with children. And I think this is a tremendous opportunity moment as well while we work diligently to protect women from harm. I also think we have an amazing opportunity to get fathers and mothers to talk to their sons about healthy masculinity. You have no excuse that you're not in the same room together to be able to do this. So as we move ahead, I think those are issues that need to be talked about. Looking at the structural, looking at social determinants, looking at gender beyond sex disaggregation, and thinking about how we promote, while we call men out for their use of violence and protect women who are experiencing it and children, we also use this as a moment to promote equitable, healthy ideas of manhood.